Most of the settlers within the valley, especially the farmers and ranchers, helped each other. Harvest wood, build corrals and cabins, plan needed water and road infrastructure and celebrated. Danced happy settler dance and prayed joyous freedom prayers of gratitude together. They genuinely cared for each other and helped each other. Settlers knew how to entertain each other. They were their own big screen TVs. They started a wonderful tradition every Friday evening. Originally, starting as a dugout spot with a bonfire, the settlers gathered about every 10 miles or so together at designated spots within the valley and they played skits. Told jokes and played all kinds of music, they knew from whatever part of the world they came from and happy danced and entertained each other all night long. They told jokes and played all kinds of music they knew from whatever part of the world they came from and happy danced and entertained each other all night long. They would also put on skits where the audience would cheer or boo through things and interacted with the villainous or heroic performers. Then they would dance some more. When the scattered American Falls group came to the Lost River Valley, the community accepted them and they would travel a great distance by wagon or horse to attend these organized entertainment gatherings each Friday in the valley. It was mostly square dances but they danced several other kinds of dances as well. They would dance from sunset Friday until midnight, when they would have a big feed, put the children down to sleep, and then start dancing, doing skits and other entertainment until sunrise. These very interactive Friday night live music, dance, and entertainment gatherings continued up and down the Lost River Valley until sometime into the 1950s. The outlaw element continued to flourish at Antelope, since the valley sheriffs would not prosecute them for their crimes. Sheriff Charles Fury even set up his homestead next to these criminals in Antelope, knowing exactly who they were and what they did, as did the other sheriffs within the valley. Other marshals from the victims of their stealing within Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming would post wanted posters on the newly built dance school town hall doors in the valley and the sheriff and the people dancing there would ignore the wanted posters as their daughters danced with the liar die gang members in the late 1860s a road or a wagon trail was being scraped using horses as well as men and hand tools from blackfoot to the lost river valley so teams could take their supplies and goods to and from the lost river valley using a more direct route from Blackfoot. Captain McCaleb, formerly of the Confederate Army, was good friends with Sheriff Fury. McCaleb was no stranger to killing and the ferocity of war, with over 30 battles under his belt killing Yankees during the Civil War. When he went west, he found one of the richest gold claims at the Alder Creek. And when it played out, he moved into the valley where he was also made sheriff with his buddy Fury. In the Lost River Valley, the prospectors were placing claims, mostly on White Knob Mountain, named because of, well, the mountain's White Knob. <laughs> Many of the names of the mines were kind of humorous as well, like Hopeful. No, that was the prospectors. Puzzlers, Chief, Gold Eagle, Napoleon, Tip Top. These small operations began pulling out big paydays. Remember that about $800 a year supported a nice little family, a big spread of cattle, a homestead quite well. A pound of copper was worth $7 and was very plentiful around what became known as the hill, White Knob. Silver was worth $2 an ounce and that was also happy crazy found on the hill as was gold which was worth 18.90 an ounce at the time. Loggers started pulling timber for new homes. Most of the dirt floor shanties could be built for $25, that's an 8x12, and a 3 bedroom 16 by 22 cabin for $300.
Most of the farmers and ranchers as a community built their homes. But they also started logging and milling for the miners coming to strike it rich. To heat and cook a home each year required five cords of wood or $332 worth of wood from a valley logger. Remember, there were no chainsaws, just handsaws and axes. It was hand and horse labor. The horse would have a rope or cable attached to its harness to drag or snow float the logs to a sled or wagon. This is kind of ingenious. This guy invented snowboarding with a horse. <laughs> what he's doing with this log, he's cut it into a cabin length. He's standing on the end of it not to take a break or get out of work. What he's doing is helping the horse. As he stands on the back of the log, the weight helps lift the logs front and up. Then he gives the horse a little snap and they start taking off. Now the snow lubricated log can lift over the snags and float in the snow because the logger is riding in the back. So snowboarding in Lost River during the 1800s. Much of this was done at the beginning of the winter or the end of the spring so horses could pull the logs on the lubricating snow. An enterprising farmer and part-time logger could sell 10 cords of wood to the miners or a couple cabins and bring in about 600 extra dollars. This would be enough to buy a cultivator, a plow, $325, and 10 heifers and a bull, $270. A road was being constructed from Butte Camp at the south end of the valley to the north end of the valley to meet a wagon trail at Camp Era in Houston. This in turn met up with a wagon trail going to the north end of the valley to Chalice. The last shot rang out as some of the final buffalo in the area fell as meat and hides needed for winter. The meat and hides saved so much of their own herds and crops consumption, giving the ranchers and expanding flock herds for future income. The number of cattle in the valley went to nearly 4,000. The swamp had been drained and fresh water shallow wells were being dug next to homestead tents in anticipation of the new log homes before winter. Era Village! Mr. Green came with about 200 prospectors from the Era camp, quickly turning it into the Era Village. Mr. Green set up his tent and coffee shop. Cardboard boxes were uh, unheard of back then. So his coffee, sugar, bean, soup mix, and other cargo came with him in wood boxes. He set up the counter and cooking area just outside his tent, made of those boxes. Green had struck it rich. He turned a large profit on every biscuit, cup of coffee, slice of bacon, and he was selling to about 200 miners a day. The residents of Era began calling him Ham. Hey, Ham! Many miners in the tent cities were so excited to be pulling out ore from the mountain that they did not bother with building a cabin or collecting wood for heat, let alone cooking. In the old Hollywood movies, you see the school marm falling in love and marrying some hero in town. Well, it really happened in tent city dirt floor era. The new college graduate, Medora Trango, Trango sounds like a wonderful Wild West name. Met Ham Green at his dark coffee tent for some of his coffee and soup. Ham was actually a widower with a little three-year-old daughter, Bess, and probably didn't even expect sparks of love to fly in, in era, especially with a beautiful woman among the tent city filled with mostly men. Don't get me wrong, there were obviously children and wives, and there were plenty of married couples, since Medora was hired as the era school teacher. Though some of her students learning to read and write were as old as 18 and were shaving. Era could only afford or only afford her to be there during the warm and beautiful four months out of the year as their teacher. 
But Medora and Ham married, and Ham had a building built that went beyond being the local restaurant and store. It also became a pharmacy and post office, meaning Mr. Green was the first postmaster at ERA with his new little wife, the school teacher, who was about to give birth to their first child. ERA evaporated with the coming of the locomotive within the valley in 1901. Another entrepreneur was the first European settler, Mr. Lehman, who now had apples coming off about 100 apple trees, along with other fruit and berry bushes he had planted along the warm springs, so the plants would thrive in the cold Lost River Valley climate. A couple apples in that area during its beginning were worth five cents. So every other year, just off apples, Lehman could make $5,000 profit. In order to give it a little perspective in today's money, $1 million profit. Some enterprising people, realizing that there had to be stage stops about every 15 to 20 miles for people and animals to rest and feed after pulling their freight along the roads, made watering holes and livery stables for animals, as well as a stage station with a place for people to freshen up and eat. Okay, this is Mr. and Mrs. Larder's homestead right here on Whiskey Springs. And yes, the name Whiskey Springs comes from what they produced here. There's an old livery stable over here in the back and it would house a bunch of horses that would come up and deliver supplies and pick up whiskey. The family would make some money and get some supplies and they would feed these horses. They'd trade them out with the next set that was coming up. This, this is the road right here, uh, or this little wagon path that you see here is what, what came here. And this later became Highway 27 and what is behind us is Highway 93. So the, this cabin right here, that this little uh, trading post store, schoolhouse, house, and then later in the 30s, gas station, wasn't the original one. Uh, the original cabin is about 100 feet from here. There's three outcrops of this Whiskey Springs, and the original one is kind of interesting. You can see the, instead of using metal spikes on the, through the holes on the cabin and on the livery stable, you see peg holes. They actually augered holes down through the logs and put uh, pegs down through two logs, and then they'd do that as they stacked the logs on each other to, to stabilize them. I want to go down to the uh, cabin here and look inside. These are not the original floors because they have nails in them. Remember on the cabin they had pegs that they, wood pegs they put from one log to the other. So this, this is the original wall and the wood chinking is kind of V-shaped and then stuck into the wood and then they'd put uh, mud even around that. Then later on, it got wood siding. We put wood siding on the wall. There's a little layer of uh, paperboard. And, and then they had mills uh, built up from one end of the valley down to the other. They would log wood and they'd make these planks. So they'd use these planks on the, on the roof and on the floor. So, so originally, this was a dirt floor. And you can see the floor is not level at all. It just kind of, you know, <laughs> waves around there. So then, originally, their original cabin, I looked at it, it was 20 by 20. This one looks about 20 by 40 feet. And uh, these planks probably kept it warmer. This is where the fireplace originally was right in the center and the way it looks it looks like they added a stove later on they they had their cabin here and then there was about six more cabins down down the road up to the next um, 
stage stop. So the children would walk and come to this school, but they would use uh, books like uh, Tom Sawyer or, or some other novel that they had or the Bible or something like that. And they would, that would be their reader. And they'd learn math and some history and uh, would read uh, from these uh, novels to learn how to read or practice reading. So, uh, th three miles uphill both ways, yeah. Um, that, that was about right for this little community of kids. And I'm sure they just wanted to see each other. They didn't, they didn't have uh, the kind of entertainment they had, we have now. It was, it was horses, it was work, it was um, uh, sewing, m doing crafts. The culture was different. They didn't have the continual entertainment that we do now. They were their own entertainment. So, you know, mom and dad reading a book by the fire was their entertainment, their way of life. And, uh, kind of a nicer, gentler, more peaceful culture than we have now. A few stage stations even had places to stay for the night and if you happened upon a Friday then you got to enjoy dancing and yelling and throwing food at the local actors you can think of the stage station as a modern-day gas station but for teams and animals with each team needing a night to recover while feeding on several pounds of grass and water to quickly refuel well relatively quickly for the time and be completely changed out with a fresh team every 15 to 20 miles or so as they traveled. This allowed cargo and passengers to move from Blackfoot to Chalice within 24 hours in one complete day. With a vehicle today, that's two and a half hours journey. It is 130 miles from Blackfoot to Chalice. So with all the pee, feed, and sleep breaks and the changing out of teams, cargo and people, the teams and their cargo moved about 5.9 miles per hour. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Really, they thought they were flying. Now we know why most of the towns in the USA are about 15 to 20 miles apart, depending on the terrain. The distance was fixed by how long a horse and its rider could stand to travel in a day. Seriously, when I was a teenager, my friend Elmer Bear, who was born in 1899, explained this reasoning to me. When the trains came into play, the major cities grew where the goods came from, whether it was from food, fuel, metal, etc. So cities are really just giant warehouses or distribution centers. In the future, maybe they'll be named something like uh, Amazon Warehouse 1 or Amazon Warehouse 2 or Alibaba Warehouse 1, Alibaba Warehouse 2. Though the Native Americans were placed on reservations, they were still allowed to hunt outside the reservation. In 1877, the valley west of the Lost River called Pasimaroy was visited by a Nez Perce hunting party. They had traveled hundreds of miles from their reservation with very little show for their efforts. In the Pasimaroy Valley, they came upon a, a wagon train loaded with food, animals, and supplies. The Nez Perce killed seven of the men in the wagon train and took the supplies. From then on, the military started accompanying them people freighting animals through the valley. In 1878, a hunting party from the Bannock tribe noticed a great lack of buffalo in the valleys that had been drained and harvested by the settlers, ensuring the starvation of all natives in the western United States territories. Some cattle were grazing in the narrows of the Lost River Valley, open range, and all the settler cattle tasted similar, but not as good as the native buffalo. So after inspection of their brands, they harvested five of them. Some men coming up the valley with nine teams and three wagons loaded with supplies bound for Fort Chalice saw the Indians 
And remembering the killing of the settlers last year by the Nez Pierce hunting party, stop the teams in a circle for protection. They sent a messenger to Chalice to get help from the army traveling through the natives. Sheriff McCaleb was at the Chalice Fort already. McCaleb was part owner in the teams and cargo on their way. So he and his overly armed posse quickly set out to stop the natives from raiding their cargo or killing the Teamsters. The Teamsters and guards packed their wagon circle holes and with flour and other goods so they were not exposed. They also had rifles and ammunition meant for the protection of the settlers headed for Fort Chalice. You know, we see settlers circling their wagons to protect themselves in the movies, but I never thought anyone actually did that. A man from the Teamsters gathered up any other stray cattle in the area so the natives couldn't glean anymore. The Teamsters got thirsty and dug a well. They also gathered some wood and started a fire, set up a camp and started cooking, no telling how long they would have to wait. It takes hours to get to Chalice on horseback and then hours to round up a posse and ride back to the Narrows over the summit. And yes, a horse will die running over a couple miles. A very fast trot is about 12 miles an hour. So, a hundred miles round trip, nine or ten hours later, probably more like fourteen hours later, the little army finally rode up to the entrenched Teamsters and their cargo. A shot was fired, and shots were fired all day. Now think about this for a moment. All of these guys are expert marksmen, and no one was killed, or any of the cattle or horses, with the exception of McCaleb and his horse, of course. The one that should have known better stood in a Confederate officer rage that no one was being shot. He jumped out of the protection of the embankment to take a shot and was shot right between the eyes. Then they shot his horse, of course. The rest of the afternoon was quiet. They rolled McCaleb in a sheet and buried him right there. They later buried him in a different spot after the shootout and his beloved wife who was not living with him at the time of his death came and visited his grave as quick as 40 years later to say goodbye and to mourn him <laughs> chief buffalo horn of the bannock started riding around and around the army and teamsters while they shot and missed him the hunting party was whooping and laughing that night, as coyotes began to yip and cry, war drums began to beat accompanied by war hoops, and more shots were fired by very brave men on both sides. In the morning, part of McCaleb's army party left the camp of Teamsters and went over the mountain another 50 miles there to get the Chalice military. The hunting party had left before any had awoke. The reservation police captured two Bannock men and salmon that it said they'd killed McCaleb and left them in the Salmon prison. That night, the Liar Die Gang, clan style, wearing masks, simply walked the native men out of the Salmon prison and murdered them. No law official stopped them or took any prisoners for their murders, becoming accomplices to their killings. One bullet to McCaleb's head, three men died, and a horse, of course. The military used McCaleb's death as an excuse to round up the native hunting parties in the Idaho Territory and made them stay on reservations, prisoners of war they had lost. They even created a re-education center for the Native American children. The children would suffer PTSD from the treatment they received within the re-education centers for generations to come. Now, look at this old film, The Natives with Teddy Roosevelt. Just two generations later, they look and dress like any European American. It's amazing how quickly the re-education worked to annihilate an entire culture. 1890 came quickly to the valley. People had somewhat recovered from the infamous sheriffs and the Laodaya gang. Business was booming for the ranchers and farmers in the valley and children were being born every day. The Clayton stage line was 
paying the stage stops good money to accommodate their customers and teens pulling their goods. This money poured in from the stage stops brought extra money to the valley farmers who supplied hay and food for the people running the stage lines. Sheriff Charles Fury just finished branding 21 new colts, introducing them into his horse herd as did his neighbors, the Liar Die Gang, in the fall of 1890. The grass was impressively deep, up to the back of many animals, plenty of open range feed available for everyone's animals. The wind and snow started early that fall. Though it was always cold during the fall, the wind, the wind seemed to make it unbearably cold even for the wild animals living in the valley that year. Cabins and tents on the mining mountain camps were buried by snow. The most vicious part of the winter is not the bears, they're hibernating. It's not the snow. Hey, hey, a little help please. I'm on top of the cabin. Yep, I believe it was on top of White Knob where they invented hang gliding. On White Knob, the snow and the cold is trumped by the wind. and many swore never to stay on White Knob again. It was sometime in January of 1891 that the Fury family saw their horses for the last time plowing chest deep through the snow near their homestead. They woke up the next day and the valley was perfectly smooth with several feet of new snow covering both animal and their feet for miles up and down the valley. The valley elevation at Mackey sits right around 6,000 feet, which is higher than many of the world's mountains. If the families within the valley stayed after the devastating losses of the winter of 1891, the farmers of the valley all decided to start storing and stocking hay and making, I want to keep my animals alive through hell's wind and snow shelters for their sheep and cattle near the stacks. This would allow their animals to survive another apocalyptic where did my cabin go winter. Remaining residents began logging for the miners during the spring and fall, which helped the valley ranchers bring back the flocks and herds once again over the next few years. One of the children from that time said he was always hungry and that if it wasn't for milk from a surviving milk cow and eggs from a few chickens kept in a shelter from the snow and cold, he would not have had any protein. He remembered shucking the leaves and thorns off thistle plants and eating their cores until he couldn't eat any more and still being fat belly hungry. He also said that the roads would close for the worst parts of the winters and for the other parts of the winter when the snow was shallow they would use horse-drawn sleds to get around. Mining towns throughout the western United States are famous for their rowdy gambling, fist-fighting, bar, gun fights, and whorehouses. Every day after work for many of the more irresponsible, mostly single miners, it was like an end-of-the-world party at the whorehouse. Corporations were buying up claims from miners and then turning around and paying them top dollar to mine their old claims. Many of the new owners and managers from the mines and mining camps established saloons and whorehouses to get back some of the money they were paying their men for mining. I, I used to work just right up here, about 10 miles from here, at a mine that's been shut down for 23 years, so that really dates me. <laughs> uh, this is an old uh, boiler door. This is where they'd shove the coal in, um, in into the boiler. This, you notice that it was, it's made out of cast iron. 
And so all these little rivets here, when this was cast, those holes had to be in the cast. And then the rivets were put in to join this piece of metal to, to the door. The, uh, nothing was welded. You could see, you could see that these rivets hold this piece of metal to this piece of metal to this piece of metal, this ring to the chimney to the stack here. Uh, these rivets were put in here to hold this ring on there. Ah, it's hot still. What? <laughs> something we noticed while doing research into the people of the valley. There were no graves, there were no pictures or stories of any of the prostitutes that populated the whorehouses in the Lost River Valley. In 1875, the U.S. made it federal law that prostitutes could no longer be bought overseas like China and India. The slave trade had to stop, and that was to include women. The brothels were still maintained at 85,000 women in the U.S. in the 1890s. The average age for a prostitute being induced into a brothel was 13. Most of them were taken from orphanages or found on streets as runaways in the larger cities. The average life expectancy for a prostitute was five years. This lifespan was shorter than a mangy, flea-infested, starved dog and loved less. That meant that most sex slaves never saw the age of 20 in 1890. Brothels in Mackey lost ground. The citizens didn't want any kind of brothel in, in the area. So they outlawed the, the brothels and then the miners and the other patronage, <laughs> well, there was, there was judges that uh, came here, lawyers, uh, businessmen, and bankers. It wasn't just the miners, but uh, the brothel was no longer allowed, or brothels no longer allowed within the city limits. So they moved them just outside the city limits, built six of them. They were called the Yellow Houses. The the story, I, I've, I've heard different uh, versions, but I'm not sure that the women in the brothels um, really wanted to be there. Uh, some of them had bars on the windows. Perhaps you doubt whether they were really slaves or not. Then answer me. Why else did they have bars on their windows and weren't allowed to leave? At this time, it was U.S. federal law not to commit abortion or kill unborn children. It was considered murder. There were uh, basically daycare orphanages, if you will, uh, for them to raise the kids uh, because they didn't abort the fetus. They, they had the kids when they got pregnant and so they had to do something with the kids and they did take care of the kids and raise the kids. Now check this, the sex slaves would not kill their unborn babies. In fact, they had daycare centers for their children born from these men using them. One of the prominent wealthy businessmen in the valley came testing out his new brothel girls, and he began arguing and fighting with one of them. The fight led to the businessman beating the brothel girl over the head with a bottle of wine. Her skull was smashed in the forehead, and it took her three days to die from the wound. The local self-made dentist, veterinarian, brothel doctor, and future mayor of Mackey performed weekly checks of the prostitutes in the brothels to see if they were infected with the disease. When the girl died, he removed the top part of her skull, taking the evidence from off her head. Someone charged the wealthy businessman with murder, and during the trial, the prosecuting attorney asked if she could have died from pneumonia. And the brothel doctor said, she most definitely did. She most definitely did. The judge then asked the same question of the doctor and the brothel doctor responded in the same way. The doctor kept the girl's skull on his desk for years after that. As a reminder to the wealthy lie or die gang businessmen of the area of what they owed him for becoming an accomplice in her murder. 
At first, there were no formally educated doctors in the valley. Your spouse and your neighbor were the only hope you had if you got injured to help you mend and to help you get those crops in. Later, there were two real doctors in the valley. Dr. John Gu, who was a formerly educated and licensed surgeon from Columbia in Washington, D.C. He had a beautiful home built in Mackey, which stands to this day. And Dr. Francis Richards, who graduated from medical college in Philadelphia. The Valley also had three main midwives, Grandma Harris, Mrs. Gil Thompson, and Mrs. Scott Vaught who delivered hundreds of babies and acted as nurses to the doctors. These two doctors and three midwives did not have antibiotics or a hospital with clean rooms to work from. They had battles with scarlet fever throughout the valley at one point. Even a cut or a broken arm or an infected appendix was deadly. When an operation occurred, they would line the patient's room at home with clean sheets and disinfect as much as they could to keep the patient from getting infected. These doctors and midwives would stay with the patient until they looked like they would recover, becoming beloved by the whole valley. We found a couple stories of murders on the mine hill. One of these murders sounded insane, and the guilty man openly admitted to killing some guy. He stuck in a box. He went to trial, was convicted, sent to prison, and then let out the same day and was told to leave town. <laughs> The next miner to kill somebody didn't even go to trial, they just told him to leave town. It appears the injustice was still alive and growing like the cattle in the valley. The old Houston prison was sent to Mackey just recently and is kept by the Mackey Historical Society, even though the prison was built before Mackey was. And the other group that did not have pictures, I mean, they had early pictures of Russians and Norwegians and Civil War veterans at mine the hill, as well as many others, but no stories and pictures of the Chinese lies, or even graves, who also mined the mine hill. Supposedly, the Chinese miners had opium dens and kept to themselves, saving money to send home to build a little rock garden and fish pond next to their restaurant and home decor with a beautiful wife in China when they returned. One story goes that some of these miners heard that the Chinese were leaving with their goods, horses, and money, and they organized a posse. This posse hid out in the outskirts of the valley and ambushed the Chinese miners as they left, killing them, taking their money and animals and possessions. There is no investigation into the murders of these Chinese miners. We were going to end this episode with an original settler's famous cowboy poem from one of the best comedic entertainers in the valley and the territory, Clarence Eddy. He wrote scores of entertaining cowboy poetry, jokes, and stories to entertain the original Lost River citizens. Sadly, his poems, along with his possible honors, position, business, and money he would have made from them, were stolen. The Valley's favorite poem, and they loved to have him tell, was called The Devil Came Down to Mackey. Maybe you can guess a verse or two.